Okay, with all 32 nations now having qualified for the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, which takes place in November and December of this year, let's break down the eight groups. Um, and there's four nations per group. Uh, and there's only one debutant uh, in this year's World Cup, and that is the host Qatar. Every other nation has appeared at a World Cup before. So some really fun matchups in the group stage, um, some very interesting groups. And with how certain teams are playing right now, some, some big nations are actually vulnerable and may fail to get out of the group stage. But let's break down uh, the groups. Let's preview each group, and then we'll figure out from the knockout stages uh, who's going to go how far in the tournament. Now, we have now seen what the weather conditions are going to do. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit warmer this time of year than in November and December, but we've seen in the Australia and the Costa Rica games how the temperatures did impact play and how it did impact you know, fitness levels, performance, uh, and um, ultimately the quality of the product. Now, I felt the Costa Rica-New Zealand game was the better of the two games. Uh, the Australia-Peru game, I think the heat had more of an impact. Quite possibly, the uh, Costa Rica-New Zealand game, it may have cooled off slightly quicker. Who knows? Uh, but cramp was a big issue. Uh, the pace of the game did drop off. And with the Australia-Peru game, I also went to extra time and penalties, and it was very obvious the fatigue levels were through the roof. But let's break it down. Let's start with Group A, which is Qatar's group, the host group. So in Group A, alongside Qatar, we have Ecuador, Senegal, and the Netherlands. Very interesting group. Probably one of the weaker groups on paper. For me, I think Senegal are possibly the best team in Africa right now. Uh, the Netherlands... They can be workmanlike at times, and sometimes they can be absolutely brilliant, but they had a very poor Euros last year. Ecuador could be the real dark horses out of the three big nations um, in the group stage. They have some fantastic talent. They're great with their skill, uh, and, and they have a bit of nastiness about them as well, as most South American nations do. They have that cynical nature to their game. Uh, Qatar, obviously, being the hosts and debutants, they could be the weakest hosts we've ever seen, worse than South Africa in 2010. Now, South Africa actually have a sporting pedigree. Qatar really don't. But I think Senegal and the Netherlands will be the two nations to get out of Group A. However, we've got five months, a lot of friendlies, more Nations League games for the Netherlands to play. Anything uh, can obviously happen between now and November with team selection, injuries, etc. But I think Senegal and the Netherlands will be the two nations to get out of Group A. Group B, England's group. Iran, USA and Wales make up Group B. England's Nations League performances recently and their performances since the Euros uh, have been not great, if I'm being honest. Um, the England-Iran games will be very interesting because Iran will set up very, very defensively and England are very slow and methodical in possession at times. If England play like they did against Albania in that first half, they will beat Iran. If they play like they played against Albania in the second half, it could be a tough slog. Um, and England only scoring one goal from open play, I think, in five matches or something. Uh, it's just not good enough. Uh, one penalty uh, since the, you know, in five games is just in, not great. Um, failures to score. In many games, uh, the, the two defeats to Hungary highlighted a lot of the depth issues uh, that uh, England are having. Iran, as I say, will be very, very defensive, very structured, very organised. May not be the best in possession, but defensively, they're going to be hard to break down. Uh, their match against the USA looks to be very, very tasty. The USA obviously didn't qualify for the last World Cup. They will want massive, drastic improvement, being the next World Cup host alongside Canada and Mexico, who have also both qualified for this tournament, which is very, very interesting. Uh, the USA, obviously, they want to put down a marker for four years' time. When they're co-hosts, they want to really impress. They do have Christian Pulisic. Uh, he's a superstar player. And then we have Wales, Aaron Ramsey and Gareth Bale. Um, a lot depends on Wales... Well, Wales, a lot depends on Aaron Ramsey and Gareth Bale's fitness and, and, you know, their impact upon the team. Now, Wales do have some young up-and-coming players. We saw that in the game against Ukraine. They were fantastic. Um, they really... And Wayne Hennessy, I think, uh, was a hero that day. Um, but a lot, much depends on what Gareth Bale and his fitness levels and Aaron Ramsey, their two key players... If either of them are injured or not fully fit, that could be a concern. The Wales-England game looks quite tasty. This group, I think, is very hard to predict. I do think England will get out of the group, but I think that as, as they're playing right now, they're going to labour. Uh, Wales, first World Cup since, you know, what, the 50s, 60s, something like that. Very long time. They've been appearing at Euros recently, but as I say, I think the USA might have a little bit too much depth for Wales and a bit more experience at international level, at this at tournament level. But with Gareth Byrne and Aaron Ramsey on your side, Anything's possible. I think Iran may may scrape a draw here or there, but I don't think Iran win a game. 
Uh, but the USA Iran game looks quite tasty, and as does the England Wales game. Um, you know, two derby matches, so to speak. If that was club level, that would be mass police presence. You know, seg mass segregation, uh, and you know that would, they they could be some of the, the best group games actually going in in a group that may fail to may may underwhelm. Group C, oh, this looks tasty. Uh, Argentina, Mexico have got history in the World Cup going back in you know, 2006, for example, that Maxi Rodriguez goal. Um, Saudi Arabia and Poland. Saudi Arabia were, were terrible uh, in Russia four years ago. Uh, Poland, much hinges on Robert Lewandowski uh, and the supporting cast. The supporting cast needs to give him uh, some scoring depth. Uh, Poland do have some talented players, but they're too Lewandowski-centric. So if Lewandowski is injured or not fully fit or is out of form, Poland could struggle. Saudi Arabia, I think, are going to be bottom of the group. I think the top two actually will be Argentina and Mexico. Uh, and I think the Mexicans, with the fact that a lot of their players play in the MLS, could benefit from this tournament being played in November and December when a lot of those players will be fresher, not mid-season. Um, and so that could be very, very interesting. Argentina, they're, they're big, they're big tournament, you know, big tournament team. Um, whether Messi decides that this is his last tournament, uh, but they have a good supporting cast. It's not just the Messi show. Uh, in recent years, however, squad depth, squad selection, players not being fit going into the tournament, ill discipline act tournaments. Um, there have been some concerns, but Argentina could be a dark horse for the tournament. I have no doubt on that. Uh, but they've got to get out of the group first. Their game against Mexico is crucial for who tops the group, in my opinion. Poland, a lot too much, I think, hinges on Lewandowski's fitness and his form going into the tournament. We know he's leaving Bayern Munich. Where does he play this coming season? Uh, and, you know, he's getting on in years now. He's not as young as he used to be. How, you know, has he lost half a yard? Um, you know, that is a very hard group to predict. I think Saudi Arabia finished bottom. Uh, group D, the holders France. Australia, who obviously qualified via the playoff the other day. Denmark and Tunisia. Um, Australia have to play better than they did against Peru. Uh, now they've actually had a taste of what the conditions are actually like. They can probably better prepare themselves over the French, the, the Danes. The Tunisians, obviously with their background, will be used to desert conditions. Obviously being a Saharan state in North Africa. Very similar conditions when you know they are in training camp at home. Or, you know, uh, having home internationals at this time of year. Um... Very difficult one to predict. France aren't playing well at the moment. Uh, Denmark. Denmark played a very good Euros. Uh, got to the semi-finals. Australia. Obviously, that's five World Cups they qualified for in a row. But they do need to up their game. And there were some aspects about the Australian uh, performance against Peru that have me slightly concerned. Um, while, you know, they won the game, they didn't create a lot. They created more than Peru did, but they didn't create a lot a lot, considering that they were the better side. They did control the tempo much better than Peru. But they do have no experience in playing in Qatari conditions. Tunisia, they haven't been as regular at the World Cup, I think, as they would like. A lot of their players are based in France and, and also other European leagues, so they've got that European flavour to their lineup with with where their, their players play their club football. But I think the French will want to bounce back from the Euros. However, their form since the Euros and at the tournament itself wasn't great. Um, but hey, this French team have you know turned up in in, in the World Cup four years ago and the Euros, uh, obviously uh, six years ago, and got back to back finals. They had a uh, had a poor performance last year. They clearly want to run, you know arrest that. They got Mbappe. They got Griezmann. What Paul Pogba turns up? That's very interesting. What mood will Pogba be in? Because he didn't, he hasn't played well for about eighteen months. Uh, he's been, he's been struggling at Man United. Uh, he didn't play well at the last Euros. Mbappe was also pretty poor last summer. Denmark, I mean that Christian Eriksen story brought them together. Um, they do work well as a unit. Uh, they do have some very skilled players as well. But as a unit, they play very very well. And when you've got you know Kasper Schmeichel, a world class goalkeeper um, who can pull off saves he has no business making, uh, they they look quite dangerous. And they, they, they played Australia four years ago as well uh, in the group stage. So they'll be very familiar with each other. Uh, I think Denmark are actually, I think, going to top this group. I think it's a toss-up between France and Australia for second place. I honestly do. I think the French aren't playing well right now. Uh, group E contains Spain. Uh, Costa Rica obviously beat New Zealand last night, as I'm recording this video. Uh, Germany and Japan. Very interesting group. Spain didn't have the best Euros. Um, and while they have world-class players uh, throughout their lineup, they still play with that false number nine, false ten. So they don't actually play with an out-and-out -out centre forward. But then when you've got Morata, who is an out-and-out -out centre forward, in your squad, that is a bit of a head-scratcher for me. Um, Costa Rica, 
they were very exposed. They got exposed against New Zealand quite badly, and they are an aging squad. Um, they are they are one of the older squads. I think they've got some good young talent coming through, but some of their key players are what you call veterans. So could their age count against them? Uh, and with this expected heat and the con- conditions that they're going to be, you know, you know, playing in at around thirty degrees for kickoff uh, in the evenings. You know, could the pace and technicality of Japan, you know, the Germans have got a lot of young players in and around their squad with a, with a veteran core, and the Spanish, you know, they can pass a team to death. So if the, the Spanish can get on top of the conditions and control possession, Costa Rica, while they do play this very organised defensive game, they were opened up a, a lot against New Zealand. They conceded a lot of chances from open play. Uh, and it was Caio Navas that kept bailing them out. Um, you know, this could be his last tournament. I fear. Um, the Japanese are very good technically. Uh, they always have good pace on the ball, good movement. They're well organised. And in the last World Cup, they played one of the best games of the tournament against Belgium. It was really end-to-end. There was none of this play, wind down the clock in the corner. They were going for it. The Belgians were going for it. This group could be very open. Germany have been on the downswing lately. Um, they are introducing fresh faces. They've got a new coach. Yogi Lerb has moved on. Um, I still think Spain and Germany will the top two in the group, although how four years went four years ago for Germany, Japan could be, the, I think, the dark horses to maybe make top two in the group. That one isn't set in stone. The Spanish have to play better as well. Um, yes, they do play without this out and out centre forward, and that works when you're, you're passing the ball around and, and the opposition just want to defend, like Costa Rica will probably hit them on the counter attack. But against Germany and Japan, I'm not sure that style of play is actually going to work. It may work against them, but we'll see. Uh, Group F, Belgium, Canada, Morocco, Croatia. Um, I think the Canadians are the dark horse of this group. Belgium, I mean, they had that 4-1 defeat to the Netherlands the other day in the Nations League. (sighs) Yes, they got De Bruyne, uh, but Lukaku, his form has gone off a cliff. He hasn't really had a great season with Chelsea. Um, But you've got De Bruyne in that side, the Hazard brothers. So you've got Courtois in goal who's obviously just come fresh off that Champions League performance in the final, where he just stood on his head against Liverpool. Belgium, could this be that last chance with the group of players they have to to lift a major trophy? Because they promise much, but right at the end of tournaments, they get to the latter stages of tournaments, be it World Cups or Euros, and then they don't take that next step. They want to be better than third place that they were four years ago. And there's there's a reason why they're one of the top ranked nations consistently in the world, always in the top handful of nations. They've been ranked first overall several seasons um, in recent years. Canada, dark horses. And the way they're playing, and I think, again, the time of year the tournament's been played, a lot of MLS-based players could suit them with them being fresher, better rested, and they've got a great team unity. That recent strike over their uh, contractual arrangements with their federation and, and sponsors shows how united this Canadian squad is. That's brought them closer together. First tournament since 1986. Co-hosts in four years' time. They want to prove something. Uh, Morocco. Uh, again, a lot of their players play in Europe, uh, mostly in France. Although they're scattered all over the European leagues. Um, so they'll be you know, physically fit. They'll be well organised. Technically, the Moroccans have always had great technical ability. Um, it's their discipline and, and, and focus that lets them down. And, and Croatia, an ageing Croatian side, didn't have a great Euros. You know, how much more has Modric and Rakitic got in the tank? Obviously, Perisic has just signed for Tottenham. He, he, he's, he's, what, he's, like, he's 33, going on 24. Uh, he, he plays the game like a, a player in his early mid-20s, not a player in his early mid-30s. But, you know, how much more has Modric got left in the tank? Rakitic, I mean, they are ageing now um, as their leadership group. Uh, you know, a lot of their golden generation have now retired. Could could age be counting against them, especially with the conditions that they are going to be facing? And at the Euros, they didn't fully fire on all cylinders. They weren't the Croatia of 2018. So Croatia could be vulnerable. I think Belgium topped the group, and it's a toss-up between Canada and, and, and Croatia in my mind. I, I hope the Canadians make at least the knockout stages because that builds them for four years' time. But I think Croatia have enough veteran presence in that squad is whether, you know, they can make it out of the group stage and, and do something because I think the the, the, the the weather conditions, the climatic conditions could count against them with, with that veteran nature of their squad, especially with the Canadians being young, vibrant. The Moroccans, you know, when they are in camp in Morocco, for example, playing home internationals, again, used to quite hot conditions. Again, being on the 
you know, the Sahara periphery of the Sahara and Belgium just with their, their quality um, and, and being one of the most consistent nations in recent years. Group G, uh, Brazil, always one of the favourites for a World Cup. Serbia, uh, they're going to be gnarly opposition. Switzerland, always well organised, um, always focused, hard to break down. And they've got some good players, the Swiss. And Cameroon, um, you know, in attack, they can be brilliant. Defensively, they can be a shambles. Cameroon, always a colourful, always come with high energy, if not the end product. And of course, the Cameroon sides of the 90s, they want to emulate they've got the players to do it it's just getting all the good bits together and eradicating the the, the lack of focus at times the mistakes the openness of defense they have the talent to tear teams apart cameroon could be a dark horse to make the latter knockout stages but when you've got brazil and switzerland in your group serbia the last world cup i think they underperform with some of the, the players they have available the swiss as i say always organized always not necessarily workmanlike but they do play a very good system um, they had a very good Euros, you know, they really did. Um, they really, you know, I think performed above themselves. They've got some great players as well who can individually do things, but Brazil. Um, Brazil want to eradicate eight years ago, where they lost in the semi-final 7-1 in Brazil. Um, it's been a long time since a World Cup final for the Brazilians, a long, long time, 2002. It's been 20 years since they last made a World Cup final. Um, when, when you've got the likes of Neymar and, and the supporting cast of Brazilian players, because they've got some fantastic players. Some of the, Alisson and Edison, you know, they're the, the two best goalkeepers in Europe right now, if not the world. With Neymar, when he's not rolling around on the floor, what he can do, he can be brilliant, but he's not consistent enough. Uh, and, and he spends half the time simulating injury, which is so frustrating because he has the, so he's one of the most talented players in the world. Uh, so I think Brazil do make out the group. I think the Swiss will be second. Cameroon, maybe uh, do something. Serbia, I think, will finish bottom of the group. I just think the Serbians, well, they've got the talent. They're disciplined. They can allow the emotion of the occasion to get to them. Uh, and with a lot of Albanian heritage players playing for the Swiss, that's going to be a tasty matchup. Uh, it really, really is. We saw what happened uh, four years ago between the Serbs and the Swiss. Um, and, and Albanians and, and some of the, the sanctions handed down by FIFA and some of the punishments handed out. That's going to be a tasty game. Cameroon, we don't know what to expect from them. They could be absolutely brilliant and a breath of fresh air or they could it could be a disaster and, and anything's possible. Cameroon. Finally, Group H, Portugal, Ghana, Uruguay and South Korea. Portugal, is this Cristiano Ronaldo's last tournament? Is this his last hurrah? But the Portuguese, Diego Jota's in there. He's a brilliant player. Um, and they've got some other fantastic creative midfielders as well. They didn't have a great Euros, though. They, they really want to snap out of the malaise they've been in. They haven't been great the last couple of tournaments. They've been a bit lethargic and sluggish, and they haven't quite set them, you know, set the world on fire. And there is more than just Cristiano Ronaldo in Portuguese football. Just remember that. Uh, it's not just the Ronaldo show. Um, I think possibly Ronaldo actually makes the team worse than better. When it comes to tournament, not qualifying tournaments, because it does become the Cristiano Ronaldo show. The supporting cast is, is more than capable of, of working as a team. So they need to get that balance right. Is Ronaldo going to go? That's going to be interesting. I think they're favourites for the group. But I think the Ghanaians and the Uruguayans are going to push them. All the way. Uh, Uruguay, I mean, Suarez, this is his last hurrah. Cavani's last hurrah. They want to give it one last shot at a World Cup, and they're leaving. They look at their pedigree in, in the last three tournaments, uh, you know, getting to the semi-finals in 2010, and they're still banging the goals in now. Uh, Suarez has had a renaissance at Atletico in the last couple of seasons. Of course, he's obviously moved on from Atletico now. And Cavani, I think he was a good pickup for Man United as a depth player. Uh, he did score some crucial goals for Man United the last two seasons, um, and yeah, where he plays this season is crucial as well for his involvement uh, with the Uruguay side, but don't count them out. South Korea, they're workmanlike at best. Um, yes, they beat Germany four years ago, but that was a very poor um, German performance four years ago. Uh, I don't think South Korea are on the same level as Japan. I'm not saying they're a bad side. They got Sun, you know, Sun Yi Min um, in, in the side uh, from Tottenham. And 
he's a brilliant player. I think he's a better player than Harry Kane. Uh, I think he's possibly Tottenham's best player. He's one of the best players in the Premier League uh, on his day. Uh, he's a fantastic attacking midfielder striker. He can play those kind of striker attacking midfielder. Maybe you can play him on the wing occasionally if you if you need to. He's a great attacking player in the final third. He can play anywhere across that final third. He can play around the left, he can play around the right, even down the middle, just behind the front striker. He's South Korea's best player for a very, very long time, uh, since Jason Park. Um, and much hinges on South Korea progressing on him. So hopefully the supporting cars, because they have good technical ability, can give them enough support and enough depth scoring and enough uh, you know, depth play so it isn't the sun show. Same with Ronaldo. He's got to uh, delegate some responsibility to some of the other Portuguese players because they have the talent, like Diego Jota, for example, is a brilliant uh, clutch goal scorer. He can pop up in places he really has no business popping up in and score goals. Uh, Ghana... Much like Cameroon, they can be brilliant, they can be frustrating. Uh, much like Senegal as well, they can be brilliant and frustrating in equal measure. Uh, but the Ghanaians, I think, are a far better organised African side than Cameroon, in, in my opinion. I think they, they're they much better structured, but I like watching that unstructured play. So I want to see just the, the shackles, you know, the, you know the, let them play. Don't overcoach them. I want to see them just attack with flair and flamboyance. Um, so group H is very difficult because... All four of those nations could top the group and all four of those nations could finish bottom of the group. And I do mean that. Portugal weren't great last year. Uruguay, they are an ageing squad in certain areas of their squad. Ghana can be brilliant and can be disastrous. And South Korea, hopefully it's not too much emphasis put on Son and the, and the rest of the supporting cast can give him the support to get over the line. But there you go. There's a breakdown of the eight groups and the 32 nations. Um, only one debutant which is fantastic. Only one debutant. That is a, a little stat that I think a lot of people won't realise. Some of these groups are really hard to predict. Others are a bit easier, um, in my opinion. Uh, but some are really, really hard to predict. Uh, very balanced groups, I think. Um, I think if England were playing well, I think their group would be the easiest. They're not playing well. That's why it makes it a balanced group. Uh, France aren't playing well at the moment. So Australia are dangerous. Denmark are a pretty decent side. I mean, they drew with them when France, you know, won the World Cup. It was the only nil-nil draw in the entire tournament. Um, and, and, you know, while Denmark are very defensively sound, they, they can be dangerous going forward. They proved that at the Euros. You know, Belgium, can they finally deliver? Uh, Brazil, can they finally make, you know, another World Cup final after 20 years? Uh, Spain, playing without that out-and-out centre-forward. Is that ticky-tacky hybrid style? Is that completely dead? Or is there a renaissance of it? You know, there's a lot of unanswered questions. But there we go. There's my preview for the World Cup uh, later this year. Uh, please place your thoughts in the comments section below. I know this is a longer video than normal, but there is a lot to break down um, with the groups and the teams that have qualified. I actually think this could be one of the most open World Cups we've ever seen, partly because of the weather conditions and the heat and the fact that a lot, pretty much all the games have got to take place at night, uh, air-conditioned stadiums, it's going to be a different tournament environment than what a lot of these players are used to. So that's going to be really interesting to see how which teams adapt best to the conditions. And I do think some of the some of the so-called lesser nations might actually have some very very good tournaments and might cause a, there could be a lot of upsets in here. So there's nothing guaranteed. And some big nations will go up, go out at the group stage or early on in the knockout stages that we would not otherwise expect to fall so early. So there we go. Thank you very much for watching. Please place your thoughts in the comments section below and I will have some more videos up for you very, very soon.